As mentioned in the previous episode, fomenting ill feelings towards the enemy was one goal of wartime propaganda. To encourage greater, more enthusiastic participation in the war effort, propaganda portrayed the enemy as evil, deceptive, and even inhuman, with ideals and goals that endangered our way of life. Depicting the enemy as animals or demons was a common simile, but tended towards the abstract universal other. That is to say, as we saw last episode, both Allied and Axis propaganda compared the enemy to rats, spiders, monkeys, and even devilish monsters. Another method of demonizing the enemy utilizes universal fears, historical events suitably embellished, or alleged true events. A few notorious incidents could greatly bolster the propagandist case. The depiction of enemy atrocities in wartime propaganda serves several purposes. By showing the enemy's brutal acts, it reinforces the image of the enemy as morally corrupt, evil, and degraded. This may lead to feelings of disgust, outrage, and even hatred of the enemy, and an acceptance of drastic measures needed to defeat them. These might include rationing and other war-related service activities, all the way to the employment of weapons of mass destruction. Furthermore, portraying the enemy as murderous, destructive, monstrous brutes capitalized on a generalized anxiety of invasion and conquest and its horrifying consequences. This is what the enemy does, propagandists suggested, and if we don't win the war, it could happen again. While instilling fear of the enemy was not necessarily considered a positive outcome by propagandists, properly managed fear might encourage greater contributions to the war effort. Atrocity propaganda dates back to the 19th century and the introduction of mass media. As we shall see, while specific incidents are frequently utilized to make atrocity tales more relevant and timely, basic themes were used and reused over the years, regardless of the conflict or the participants. World War II anti-Axis propaganda made some distinction between the Nazis and the Japanese with regard to atrocities. There were many common themes, and a fair number of comic book covers depicted Nazis and Japanese cooperating to commit atrocities. However, in general terms, the Japanese were often criticized specifically for their treatment of enemy soldiers, while the Nazis were singled out for mistreatment of the civilian population of the countries they had invaded. This dichotomy is understandable. The Nazis had conquered Western and Central Europe, the ancestral homeland of many Americans. Thus, the suffering of the civilian population was of particular interest to American audiences. Conversely, although there was general horror after events such as the massacre in Nanking, China by Japanese troops in 1937, much wartime propaganda after December 1941 focused on American prisoners of war in Japanese hands, rather than on the indigenous people of the Pacific region who were being oppressed by the Japanese. Another heavily used trope on wartime comic book covers was a depiction of the Japanese armed forces breaking the rules of warfare, utilizing deceit, barbaric practices, and banned weapons. In this episode, we shall look at some examples of different categories of atrocities depicted on wartime comic book covers, beginning with the women in peril theme. The most prevalent atrocity theme on comic book covers was women in peril. The total number of comic book covers depicting women in danger of losing their virtue and or their life is more than double the next highest category. Although this statistic is skewed because showing women in danger is a universal motif in popular culture, wartime or not. Movie posters, magazine covers, comic books, it didn't matter. Villains threaten women. It's just what they do. Wartime comic books were not solely aimed at juvenile readers. Fiction House, for example, published a line of comics which aimed at a slightly older audience, eschewing superheroes in favor of specific genre-oriented titles, resembling pulp magazines, which the company also published. The Fiction House artists seemingly competed to place the most voluptuous women in the most dangerous situations. <laughs> 
A distinction between the Nazis and the Japanese appears on wartime comic book covers in the women in peril category. The Nazis tend to treat women as experimental subjects for their mad scientists and super weapons, or as prisoners or hostages to be interrogated then executed. These covers have some sadosexual overtones, of course, but the anti-Japanese covers are more overtly oriented towards images of leering enemy soldiers threatening helpless women with torture or a painful demise just for the sinister fun of it. To be fair, most of the time both the Nazis and the Japanese seem primarily interested in killing the women rather than soiling their virtue. Or to put it another way, in doling out death rather than a fate worse than death. This motif is reminiscent of the horror pulps of the 1930s, which showcased evil fiends whose interest in their scantily clad victims was mostly sadistic and scientific rather than sexual. The cover of Fighting Yank No. 8, dated June 1944 and drawn by Alex Schomburg, shows a member of the Waves, the women's division of the United States Navy, held captive on a Pacific island by a group of Japanese soldiers, as superhero the Fighting Yank comes to her aid. Although her blouse is slightly unbuttoned, her cleavage is not the object of the enemy's prurient interest, but rather the target of a Rising Sun branding iron. Since much non-comic book propaganda at least obliquely suggested that the enemy did have rape on his mind, the small number of comic book covers which depict women being sexually threatened could be the result of self-censorship by comic book publishers, who recognize the largely if not exclusively juvenile demographic of their audience. A relatively rare exception is Fight Comics number 35 from December 1944. Artist Joe Doolin drew a bare-breasted Pacific Island beauty being accosted by a lecherous Japanese soldier as she steps out of her hut to fetch some water for a pair of downed American flyers. Fight number 18 from April 1942 shows invading Japanese soldiers groping some light-skinned native girls. As mentioned earlier, Fiction House tended to appeal to a slightly older target audience and the contents of their covers reflect this demographic. Ruben Moreira's dramatic cover for Fight Comics number 28 suggests a Japanese soldier is about to scalp a helpless woman in his clutches, but an American soldier fortuitously arrives on the scene. This cover subconsciously implies a link between the Japanese soldiers and the mutilations committed by other so-called uncivilized enemies of the past. The fall 1943 issue of The Human Torch, another Schomburg cover, depicts a blonde dangling over a snake pit as Japanese diplomats, military men, and a rather scrawny executioner look on. Captain America 31, Schomburg art again, shows another crowded torture chamber with a blonde on the rack at the mercy of numerous Japanese scoundrels. Joe Doolin drew the cover of Rangers number 24 and this time the woman being menaced by the Japanese has black hair, but her predicament is a familiar one, on the torture rack and being threatened by a sharp weapon. Rangers number 15, cover by Art Saf, shows a native girl decorating the front of a Japanese tank. She's either a large hood ornament, a human shield, or a disposable bumper to fend off pesky spikes and other tank killing devices. While the themes of anti-Nazi and anti-Japanese women in peril comic covers differ in some instances, there are also shared motifs. Rangers number 21, dated February 1945, sports another Joe Doolin cover, this one featuring a Chinese woman in danger of losing her head to a Japanese sword. Doolin had addressed this scene before with his cover for Fight Comics number 23, June 1944, substituting a blonde European woman as the potential victim and making the black-robed executioner a swastika-wearing Nazi. Sid Shore's cover for Captain America number 23 resembles Fighting Yank number 8, replacing Japanese soldiers with Nazi maniacs, 
a tropical island with a Bavarian beer hall, a Rising Sun branding iron with a swastika branding iron, and a Navy wave with an Army whack. The cover of Captain America No. 15, drawn by Al Avison, combines the swastika branding iron trope with a super science motif, as a fiendish torturer and two Axis robots menace a young woman in the Den of Doom. Pep Comics No. 30's cover illustrates Nazi-Japanese cooperation in the abuse of women. A bestial Japanese is wielding the swastika branding iron this time under the direction of a Nazi officer, with yet another blonde woman as the object of their misaffections. The shield and the hangman crash in to help prevent her from receiving the kiss of the red-hot Hakenkreuz. Axis cooperation is also evident on the cover of The Hangman No. 3 from the summer of 1942. Drawn by Harry Lucy, the art features superhero The Hangman, a burly Nazi, a Japanese mad scientist, Nazi supervillain Captain Swastika, Dusty the Boy Detective, Roy the Superboy, and a young blonde woman sealed in a giant test tube and in imminent danger of becoming a pickled zombie like the figures on the left. Not all anti-Nazi covers in the women in peril genre were scientifically oriented. Mystic Comics No. 8, dated March 1942, has a cover drawn by Al Gabriel in which dwarfish Nazi monsters prepare to execute a young woman in an Iron Maiden which is carefully labeled with a swastika in case it should ever be misplaced. This cover would have worked as a pure horror comic even without the Nazi trademarks. However, the swastikas link the Nazis with the evil subhuman creatures on the cover. Suspense Comics number 3, cover dated April 1944, has a very evocative cover by Schomburg, eschewing his usual hyper-detailed style and content. The palm tree suggests that somewhere in Africa or Central or South America, a Nazi offshoot of the Ku Klux Klan is performing human sacrifices. Schomburg's Nazi Klansmen hybrids also appeared in a number of other comic book covers during the war. A specific subset of Women in Peril comic book covers features Nurses in Danger. This adds a touch of verisimilitude to the topic since it explains the presence of women in war zones where they might logically be exposed to the enemy. Furthermore, showing nurses being threatened reinforces the idea that the enemy doesn't respect the rules of civilized warfare, attacking caregivers and wounded and helpless men. Thus, these images contain multiple levels of anti-Axis atrocities. Nurses were heavily recruited during the war, and while much wartime propaganda emphasized the importance of the job and its direct contribution to the war effort, the dangers inherent in wartime nursing were not completely ignored. Two major Hollywood films dealt with American nurses in combat zones, So Proudly We Hail and Cry Havoc. In So Proudly We Hail, nurses on Bataan are threatened with death or dishonor by invading Japanese troops, until one of them sacrifices herself so her friends may escape. I know what I'm going to do. If somebody doesn't come, we'd better all kill ourselves. But why? Somebody's coming. Davy said somebody's coming. I was in Nanking. I saw what happened to the women there. Be quiet. When the Red Cross protested, the Japanese called it the privilege of serving His Imperial Majesty's troops. It's an honor. An honor you die from. Stop that nonsense, do you hear? I've seen them fight over a woman like dogs. Stop it. in the surgery. No, it's our only chance. We can't get through. It's one of us or all of us. Throw it away. It's too late. Goodbye, Davy. Oh, no. Olivia. 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 
The covers of wartime comic books tended to show nurses in imminent danger as they performed their duties on the battlefield or as imperiled prisoners of the enemy. Fight Comics number 24 echoes the cover of Rangers number 15, but this time it's a nurse who's trussed up and strapped to the front of a Japanese tank as a human shield. The captive nurse on the cover of Fight Comics number 27 has it even worse. She's tied to the propeller of a Japanese airplane. The enemy also did not respect the civilized norms. Wartime comic book covers frequently showed them attacking ambulances, hospital ships, and other non-combatant humanitarian symbols and organizations. As with other depictions of atrocities, real, exaggerated, or made up of whole cloth, these were intended to paint the enemy in a negative light, to encourage those on the home front to make an extra effort to help overcome the forces of darkness threatening civilization as we know it. In the next part of this episode, we shall see more examples of wartime propaganda on comic book covers, including enemy abuse of children and senior citizens, torture and summary execution of helpless prisoners of war, and depictions of the enemy's disregard for the rules of warfare, including the use of banned weapons.